This is Haystack Help Radio on KLZ 560 The Source. Haystack Help Radio is powered by HaystackHelp.com. Finding help can be like finding a needle in a haystack. But with HaystackHelp.com, finding the needle just got a lot easier. Now, the host of Haystack Help Radio, Chris Kane. Welcome back to our second hour of Haystack Help Radio. Again, my name is Scott Watley, filling in for my partner, Chris Kane. I want to thank you for joining us. Our number is 303-477-5600, and we are here to help you, and that's what our show is all about, and we've got an action-packed hour. We uh, have Claudine Champagne going to join us here momentarily with Handyman Connection, and then we'll be speaking with Bonnie Bowles with Wills and Wellness, and talk about guardianship and protecting your kids. Well, we'll go right to the phones and talk with Bonnie Bowles. Bonnie is with Wills and Wellness. And, Bonnie, how are you? Doing good, Scott. How are you? Good, good. I know you've had a busy day today as we talked this morning, so we want to yeah. thank you for taking a few minutes with us this afternoon. Absolutely. Well, you know, Bonnie, you do a, you do a great service, and I know you do a lot of free talks around the community, and um, I'll let you talk a, a few minutes about that. But the thing we kind of wanted to talk about today was about guardianship and protecting your children. And uh, so I'll let you pick that up wherever you want to. <laughs> oh, sure. So guardianship uh, in terms of just protecting the kiddos, if you've got minors at home, that's kind of my passion in life, is helping parents put the right estate plan in place to address those questions and so part of my outreach and helping parents are the free talks that you just mentioned i do about four a month um, all over denver um stapleton cherry creek denver proper littleton i do it all over and you can check that out on my website willsandwellness.com and um, in terms of guardianship in particular i've just launched something that'll really help out a lot of parents which is naming your uh, guardians for free so you can go on and at least get something basic written down and signed. Uh, but then I would always recommend bring that in, have me look at it, and then we can also address the additional guardianship questions as well. The one that gets overlooked the most is what happens in the short term, what happens if there's mm -hmm. an emergency with the parent. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one thing we talked about um, one of our last shows that we were able to do together, um, you know, a lot of people think they have a – an emergency contact for a babysitter or for their kid's school and they give them like one name and number <laughs> and, <laughs> and so tell us a little about it, your feelings on that well to me that's a good start but really a whole lot more is needed because in colorado if you don't have a legal short-term guardianship document in place in colorado if the police find out uh, about a minor whose parents are injured or missing uh, the police are only permitted to leave those minor children with the care of a blood relative. And being in Colorado, I'm one of them. I'm a transplant. There's a lot of people here who do not have blood relatives here in town. Um, and even if you do, there's the question of, well, how does the police know who they are? What might they require in terms of proving the relationship between that child and that person, grandparent or aunt or uncle? Do you want to totally bypass kind of the default? Because if the police cannot find a blood relative or are not satisfied with whatever proof may be needed, uh, the default is to send them to a foster home. And uh, for a lot of parents, it's just not at all what they would want in a situation where they do have a very close friend or family member who would step in and immediately take the child into their home, a home where the child would, would feel familiar and be able to be loved and comforted immediately by those who actually know your child and are part of your child's family. No, that's great. And, you know, I think a lot of people out there have verbal type um, agreements, I guess we could call it, saying, you know, if something happens to us, then, you know, we want you guys to take our kids and they say, OK, but tell us why that's not a good idea. <laughs> well, again, I mean, at least kind of like your emergency contact scenario, at least it's one step in the right direction. You've at least thought about it as mm -hmm. a parent, you know, who would you want to step in? The downside is something verbal obviously isn't going to work at all in that emergency situation I just described with the police, nor would it work um, in terms of deciding, well, okay, now these children really don't have parents, you know, in perpetuity, who's going to be in charge? Something verbal is not going to work in the probate court any more so than somebody else in your family who is maybe someone you would have never chosen presenting themselves and saying, well, I want to be the one chosen by the probate court. So really something verbal or no plan at all is going to ultimately land your loved ones in front of the probate judge, kind of duking it out in front of the court there to be the ones chosen by the court. 
instead of you as the parents deciding ahead of time who is the one that can step in. And then they just literally go take it to the court for for just uh, a formality, just a file stamp. The court will just say, okay, this is what the parents wanted. It's in writing. It's notarized. It's witnessed. So now we as the court don't have to make this tough decision for these kids. Right. And when we talk about, you know, wills and probate, um, we did get an email um, the end of last week there before the holiday, and somebody said, you know, what is probate? That's a great question. Probate is shrouded in mystery for a lot of people. Um, you hear about it almost always in a negative content, uh, context on something about how you should avoid probate or don't put your family through probate. Um, and really in every state, probate is used primarily for two purposes. The first is to transfer title to assets that someone who has passed away left behind without any sort of beneficiary designation or any sort of set up as to who gets that asset when you pass away. So for those assets out there where you don't have something specified, probate is used to figure out who gets it and how do we transfer title. And the second purpose of probate is if you've got any person who is legally unable to care for themselves, whether it be their finan- uh, financial affairs or their medical decision-making or general well-being, that person needs someone else to be in charge of them. And that someone else is going to need some sort of legal authority to act on that person's behalf. So the best example, obviously, is a minor. A minor is not legally entitled to handle their own financial affairs and, for the most part, can't make their own decisions about their well-being. Um, And then also incapacitated adults is where that comes into play as well. So probate would be the default process to transfer title to assets and figure out who's in charge of someone's finances and medical decisions if you haven't done any planning in the meantime. And that's where the avoid probate understanding comes in, which is for a lot of people, the point of estate planning, the point of even embarking on that process is to keep your family out of the default system, which is the probate court system. We're visiting with Bonnie Bowles. She's an attorney. Her company is Wills and Wellness. Her number is 303-881-3609. That's 303-881-3609. And you know, her website will help you immensely, and, and uh, she and I talked about her first couple of shows. Most of us have nothing <laughs> written down, and, and we need to. And, you know, I actually had a friend of mine that was listening to our show a few weeks ago, and he said that he loved the idea where you talked about where if somebody wanted to contest something in the will, then they got nothing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. so he wanted me to get, he was going to listen today, and he wanted you to explain that one more time because, you know, I guess other people in his family have gone through a lot of that, and he said, I want to do what she said. So tell us about that real quick. So basically, kind of what I call that is challenge a will at your own risk. Um, basically, if, let's say you've got a set of parents who have three children, and one of them was just a needier child more so than the others and received a lot more from the parents along their way, along the way in their lifetime than what the other kids got, just in terms, you know, financially. It may be that the parents kind of want to recognize that and maybe leave that child a little bit less ultimately down the road and leave uh, the other two kids more. So that's just kind of a general example. Mm -hmm. Um, However, when that child reads the will or even the trust, and it says something like, uh, it says exactly that. They may not be very happy. You know, it could have just said, to my children equally. But if they read that they get less, you know, they might not be uh, really happy with that. So then what they could do is try to challenge that will or trust on the basis that, you know, my parents didn't know what they were signing when they signed this. So they must not have realized that this is what it said, and they really meant to leave everything to the three of us equally. Well, that particular beneficiary is going to be in a catch-22 because with the specific type of provision that I put in, frankly, all my estate plans that I draft, it basically says that if a beneficiary challenges a will or trust and loses, they forfeit whatever they would have gotten in the first place. Wow. So then it becomes kind of an incentive to be, you know, don't mess with don't mess with the trust documents. <laughs> right. I knew what I was signing. Right. Now, obviously, if they challenge it and win, that's a totally different scenario because then there must have been some issue where the parent didn't know what they were signing or sure. weren't legally capacitated or something like that. Right. Mm-hmm. Bonnie's number again is 303-881-3609 or website willsandwellness.com. And, Bonnie, when you do these talks, what are the the main things that you find people are confused about or they never really think of? 
Well, probate is kind of the number one, well, I should say number two confusing thing at talks. And when I open up my talks, which are an hour long, um, I always clarify up front what is probate. So that way when I talk about this is how you avoid probate, there's a real good understanding about, you know, what I'm, what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to make. So that's a confusing point that I try to clear up. And the other one that I run into a lot is a, a trust versus a will. A lot of people assume, and in my opinion, wrongly, that uh, you only can, need to be old or really wealthy to even think about a trust. And to me, those are the totally wrong questions to ask. Instead, I think you should be asking as a parent, okay, if I die and my children are minors and they inherit life insurance and everything else, what happens? What is the world going to look like for them? And if you compare what it looks like under no plan at all or under a will only to what it looks like under a trust, to me that is how you decide whether or not a trust is for you. So I go into exactly how a trust works and that there are many trusts out there that exist. I explain specifically the one I'm talking about versus other trusts that can do more complicated and sophisticated planning. So I go into all those details so that you can ultimately walk away with what I hope is a good understanding about what is a trust anyway. Right. And, you know, uh, since I met you a few months ago and, and we started talking about a lot of this, I've talked to a lot of my friends about it, and a lot of the, you know, the husbands said, well, you know, my wife, she kind of knows what to do, and she can just handle everything for me automatically. And and again, there are some some things there that that maybe that may not be true mm-hmm. in some cases. Correct. Correct. Yeah. I mean, for the most part, if there's a surviving spouse, that is pretty easy for the most part, but not necessarily if you are on a subsequent marriage and have kids from a prior marriage. Mm-hmm. Um, But what I address a lot with parents is, you know, let's talk about what happens to the both of you passing away, because that's where you get into really sticky issues with minor children inheriting any amount of money and how that will work out for them. But um, if you do have a blended family, then it is still very important and not just rely on the fact that, oh, I've got a surviving spouse and they'll take care of it, because it may be that either the surviving spouse's family or that surviving spouse or your kids from a prior marriage could get totally cut out of an inheritance ultimately and that just makes for um not very pleasant thanksgiving dinners <laughs> yeah for sure okay all right bonnie well listen thank you so much and, and again we were going to have you on quite a bit because this is great knowledge for all of us and again her number 303-881-3609 that's 303-881-3609 wills and wellness.com so bonnie thank you and have a good rest of your afternoon thank you scott you too you're listening to Haystack Help Radio. We come back, we'll have Paul and I grow on with group insurance analysts and talk about health care. So give us a call, 303-477-5600.